I'm going to have Melissa Joy. She's going to come. Melissa Joy, for those that weren't here Thursday night, she travels with us around the world. She's our uh, main intercessor, oversees all the intercession for Gateway International, our ministry. And um, she's just a fun person to travel with. And we've been in forget how many nations we've actually been together, but lots. We've shared hotel rooms. We've laughed. We've cried. We've shared houses. We've <laughs> Anyway, and um, she just has a really unique story um, for her life story and uh, just a story of redemption and hope. And I, I just think I really felt the other night I announced that she would, I was going to have her do that. But I really feel that it's, it'll be a special um, presentation or a moment of hope for some of you in this room. Thank you. I've been asking the Lord all day, where do I start? <laughs> so I would actually like to start by saying welcome to you. Yeah. We know that we're welcomed here, but I welcome you, and we welcome you, and the Lord welcomes you because you're here tonight for a purpose. You're here tonight to have receive hope, and that's my heart for you is to receive great hope and to really understand the faithfulness of God in such a way that it will be life-changing to you. My testimony is really relevant. I've shared my testimony before, but I feel like in this nation, it's particularly, um, it correlates with each other. I feel like I'm speaking to family right now because you will understand and you will have been where I've been, even though we've never met. But I grew up in a Jewish home, and I'm, I'm a Jewish woman. So when I got saved, <laughs> and when I met my Messiah, it was not received. I went up to my father. I was all excited and happy. I met the Messiah. I met the one that our people have been waiting for. And when I told that to my father, my father looked at me in the face and said, I hate Jews for Jesus. So he was telling me he hated me. It was not a good moment. <laughs> but what I did for the next many, many years is I did not preach at him. I let the light speak through me to him in examples of unconditional love because he didn't grow up with unconditional love. And when you don't grow up with unconditional love, you don't even know what love is, right? You can't express something you don't have. You can't give something that you don't have. So it was a generational thing. So when he said he hated me, I had a choice to make right then and there. I could have separated from my family, or I could have followed Yeshua and just love him. Just love him where he's at. Show him honor and show him respect. It doesn't mean I agreed the, with the things that he said, but I didn't call him on it. And so for all the many, many years, 20, 25, 30 years, he looked at me in a different manner. But because I showed him love and honor and respect, the gap went closer and closer and closer together. And pretty soon, he could tell me he loves me again. It was a, an amazing time in my life. But he never received... Yeshua, until the day he was on his deathbed. And when he was on his deathbed, Yeshua came into his room. And what he had said was, you're the one I've been waiting for. And he went to heaven. He, he had passed, and he went to heaven. And to me, I could have said, all these years were wasted, God, what happened? But instead, I had great joy and great celebration in my spirit and in my heart because I'm a bottom line type of person. He could have gone to heaven or not, but he chose to go to heaven. And it didn't matter when he chose. The fact is, he chose wisely. And the fact is, he chose. One month ago, my mother passed away. 
And it was a difficult decision because I was thinking, do I go to India? Do I stay home? Do I do what God has told me to do and let the dead bury the dead, right? <laughs> or do I, what, what if she passed when I was gone? You know, all these things go through your mind. But I chose and I committed to follow the Lord. So I was coming. It was a difficult decision. Day after day after day, she got a little sicker and a little sicker. And my son and I, she was in a nursing home towards the end. And my son and I, who has studied to be a rabbi, which is a redemptive thing because all my family history are rabbis. All the generations were rabbis on my mother's side. And so my, my Lord, my Father, my great Savior allowed times when it was just my son and I in the room with my mother. And he would sing. She would be anxious and sick and in pain. And my son would sing Hebrew songs over her because she hadn't met the salvation of the Lord yet. She, she didn't know. But when she was anxious and in pain, my, as my son sang to her, there was peace that came upon her. And she was able to go to sleep and be happy with a smile on her face. It was a beautiful thing. One week before she got to the point where she couldn't comprehend what was going on anymore, the Lord arranged for my son and I to be in the room again, just the two of us. So I, I went to her and I, you know, I'm, I'm pondering, you know, when it comes down to they're gonna either go to heaven or not, you have to not live by your flesh. You have to ask one more time. So as I asked my mama one more time, Brent and I were in the room and I said, Mama, are you ready to meet Jesus, your Messiah? And with all awareness, she said yes. And it was a beautiful thing. I mean, I am 61 years old. And for 40 years, almost 40 years, couldn't talk to Mom, couldn't talk to Dad. But when it came the time, and this is what I want you to hear, when it came the time for the open door of heaven to be presented... That one more time, the time that counted, it was a yes. And so I'm sitting there saying, oh, God, do I, do I say it one more time? <laughs> you know, and you kind of you get nervous because you don't want the same old answer of no. You know, you've heard that your whole saved life, the, the no. And, and I don't want to talk about this and that whole thing. But as I asked my mom, my son was sitting here. I was sitting right here, and we were facing her and holding her hand. And she said yes. And, and one week later, her mind had changed, and she, wasn't, she wouldn't have been able to make a decision anymore. So I just want to express that I understand <laughs> where many of you are at. But it doesn't deter from the faithfulness of God. Yeah. He's the way maker. Right? We sang it. We sang it tonight. I have had that song in my spirit for like two weeks now. I wake up every morning saying, you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You're the promise keeper. He has promised my generations and my people to come before Messiah. You are no different. You are no different. He is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter if you're a Hebrew person or, or a Hindi or, a, or whatever. It matters not. So I want to just bring you great hope to the promise keeper. <laughs> From the promise keeper. That he has a way where there seems to be no way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And for those of you who are in here right now whose families are not there yet, whose anger is present, and the peace of the Lord is not in your household, so your heart's kind of jitter-jitter, 
and you're not sure what to say, I'm telling you, it's not what you say. It's how you live and who you represent that's going to win your families to the Lord. Because he already has his hand on them, right? <laughs> Does he have your family or not? That's where the trust and the confidence of the Lord comes in. And I'm not presenting that it's an easy thing to stay in the faith. Because when you see in the flesh that I hate you, <laughs> or you see in the flesh, don't ask me again. Let your light so shine. Because that's what's going to touch the people. That's what's going to touch your family. And that's what's going to go to the next generation. The next generation is what we're here for. We are here for the people now, but we're here for the next generation. For my son, my grandchildren, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your mothers and fathers, your grandchildren. <laughs> right? So I just want to encourage and say have great faith and don't be weary in well-doing, not well-saying, but in well-doing is what's going to touch the lives of people. Yeah. I just, I, there's, I want to uh, talk to you tonight on uh, a divine partnership. And I'm going to go there in just a minute, but I wanted to give a little snippet Possibly when you're asking, what is Access Unlimited? And I, I recently wrote a vlog, and we did a, a, a video on um, our website, or it's actually, it's coming out. It's out. Okay, I haven't seen it yet. So, um, But just before we left, we had done a video, and we explained what Access Unlimited was all about and how it came to be. I'm not going to go into the full history of it because I want to get to really... Uh, some of the word and where the Lord wants to go. But after um, 30 some years, 35 years of pastoring, and we'd also started traveling by then anyway, we'd traveled a lot. We spoke around at different functions, different churches, and it seemed like everywhere we went and what we observed and what we'd experienced in our own life for several years is that the church was lacking understanding of their original identity and their original purpose. And that started really uh, kind of weighing on us. And we're like, God, we want to we want to get this message out. How are we going to do this? And um, at that time, we were still pastoring. And um, so we were a little limited in our travel, but we still traveled more than the average pastor. But this message just began to burn in our hearts. And so um, we began to just embrace this teaching, this revelation, and God connected us with people that were doing the same thing we were attempting to do, and he, he allowed us to meet speakers from all over the world, and this was their burning message as well, and we're like, okay, you know, you're on to something, God. Well, let's, let's get this going, and so just sitting around with our team and just germinating, and we wanted to really have an expression of how, in just two words, we could say what it was about. And we believe that with God, all things are possible. We believe that when you come and have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, and the veil was torn, we now have unlimited access. The only limit to our access is the limit you put on it. He has no limits. We're the ones that have limits. And so that, that just really became so important to us. And part of um, the, when we founded the Gateway International, which had been our, the ministry, and then we had a church, one of the main scriptures was out of Genesis 28, 17. And that was where Jacob had the encounter out in the wilderness. And, you know, the ladder appeared. But the, the thing that we really focused on was, of course, the ladder. But you know that that ladder 
in Jewish tradition, we actually sat under a teaching of a Jewish man in Jerusalem, and he is not a messianic believer, but he taught this message that they believe that that ladder was a DNA strand between heaven and earth. This was from a non-believing Jewish man. And we had felt that. We'd had people have visions of the ladder being a DNA strand. And, you know, when those, those things first come, it's like, wow. Is, I mean, do you think that's true? Or you know, We'd sit around and discuss this. And we had such great confirmation. And so out of that came the whole, we teach that we're the ladders. You. It's you. It's you that is a ladder. So the access... <laughs> is within you. Melissa Joy will be driving along sometimes and she raises both hands and she'll say, portal! <laughs> you carry, you are a portal. Yes. And a lot of people think you have to go to a building. You know, there's a holy place that you, and some of those places are holy. Don't get me wrong. We, we tour Israel and I love going in where the, it's where the presence of the Lord is. And it's not about the building. It could be in a grass roof hut. It could be anywhere. And so it's not about the building, but it's about the presence. My husband spoke about that the other night where Joshua, son of Nun, didn't want to leave the presence. And that's what it's about. It's about this connection between heaven and earth. And so that we were so longing and we thought we're just going to start carrying that message where we go. Oh, and the one thing I wanted to say, the one comment that so has impacted me, the one part of that verse in Genesis 28, and Jacob, after the whole encounter, called the place Bethel, house of El, or house of God. And it was like, this is none other than the house of God, and we did not recognize it. Church, I don't want to be a generation that doesn't recognize it. And I think that's what so stirred us. We have to get this message out. You are the house of God. It's not your church. It's you. Your church is a gathering place for the house of God. Yes, I don't demean that in any way. Please hear me. I don't say don't go to church. <laughs> but you are the church. If you look at, I referred to Peter with um, Brother Prem there, and it, what Jesus told Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Upon the rock that Peter had chosen and put his faith on. So we are the house of God. We are carrying access unlimited. Yeah, that's right. Wherever you go, you are an encounter waiting to happen. Yeah. Yesterday in the streets, we had, we had fun out shopping, and we actually got to encounter people. Yeah. We got to pray for people. Wow. We prayed for people. It was wonderful. We have eyewitnesses here tonight, and uh, some government official kind of person, <laughs> because they wanted pictures with us Americans. <laughs> and I love it. You know what? I love taking pictures, because guess what? Most of the time, I get to touch them. And I don't have to say, oh, do you need, you need Jesus? I don't have, unless Jesus, he tells me sometimes to say that. I'm not afraid to say it. I'm, I'm not really afraid of too many things. And so, but you get to touch them. Yeah. <laughs> we have a friend, Godfrey Bertel. He wrote a song called, Just One Touch from the King. Have you heard it? Changes everything. Just one touch from the king changes everything. Everything is changed. So you are him with skin on. And as you get to touch them, we're just taking a silly picture. But I could tell this one lady, she, she could tell something different. And then her husband wanted to picture with us. Then they came back to us. And we got to pray, and then John had joined us, and so we got to pray for this couple. They had a family issue that they needed prayer for. They're Hindu. They don't know Jesus yet, <laughs> but they're going to. <laughs> yeah. That happened again, and John went in to buy some clothing, and he got to pray for the guy that helped him get clothes. 
Um, you know, and we, we just, yesterday, I prayed for someone else. It was like this really awesome thing. And so um, this is what acts as unlimited. This is what we carry. But it's for everybody. It's for all y'all, they say in Texas. It's for all y'all. And so I just wanted to kind of um, give you just a brief glimpse. glimpse. We, there's a threefold process or purpose. We pull out the gold that's already deposited in people. Then we pour in the gold, more gold, that Papa has deposited in us. And then we raise them up and encourage them so they'll also do the same in the lives of, they, of those that they influence. And so I want to go on to something else, but I, I just was sitting here and I thought, you know, I'm just going to give a little snippet of what Access Unlimited is about. And so partakers in a divine partnership. I hope you realize, I think this room probably realizes it more than most, but this is a partnership. It's not just um, sitting there waiting for God to act on our behalf. He wants us to work with him. And that's what Access Unlimited is about. It's training. What is your original identity? Who did he create you to be? Just to sit in a chair and listen to a good sermon? No. No, he created you to co-partner. I have another whole teaching. I, I call it my Coco Bliss list. There's so many co's in New Testament. Co-heirs, co-partners, co, -heirs, co, -partners, co uh, partakers, I'm going to read that verse in a minute, but co-resurrected, uh, we are, we're co-everything with Jesus. And so when you get that in and you know that's your identity, and I know my husband referred to Psalm 139, on when you get a glimpse of what's on your scroll, have you done that lately? We, he said you should do that the other night. You should sit and say, okay, Papa, what's on my scroll? You'd be surprised that most of what's on your scroll you're already participating in. It's obvious that um, if I am this size, <laughs> I'm probably not going to be a ballerina, right? <laughs> I can be a worship dancer. I can do all that. But a ballerina is probably, I doubt I'd be able to do much pirouetting and standing on my toes. And <laughs> he didn't create me for that. So I start with you look at the basic things that you're interested in, the passions you have. What gets you up in the morning? It's probably on your scroll what you should be doing or what you should be. I, we teach a lot about being, not doing. The church mentality talks about what you should do. But anyway, so to partake in his divine nature is, can be a mystery, but I love mysteries. And then in Proverbs, it says, it's the glory of God to reveal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to what? Search it out. Uncover it. And John made the comment the other night, in the secret place, there are no secrets. Mystery is revealed. So if you want to know mysteries, you need to spend time in the secret place where he entrusts. Brian Johnson sings the song that he entrusts his secrets to those who have fallen madly in love with him. Any lovers in this room, you've fallen madly in love with him? You are a prime candidate for mysteries being revealed. You are a prime candidate. Say, I'm a prime candidate. I'm a prime candidate. Tell your neighbor, you're a prime candidate for mysteries to be revealed. So get ready. You need to sit on the edge of your chair when you're in his presence with anticipation, with expectation. Wow. Don't be shocked at what he reveals. I'm surprised if he doesn't reveal. I'm like, I'm not surprised when he reveals it. I'm like, yes, because he's promised to do it. He's promised to. I'm writing a book. I'm, I'm supposed to have had it finished. I didn't quite get it done. 
It's a book called, um, where did I go here? Unhinged Worship Behind Door Number Four. That's out of Revelation 4. Because a few years ago, I went out on my patio to read my Bible. And I opened to Revelation 4, one of my favorite passages. I wasn't going out to, I had no clue of what was going to happen. I wasn't asking to write a song that day. I have written some songs. I was just going out to spend time, be with him. I think my kids had gone to school, and this is my time. The sun was out, and I opened to Revelation 4, and I read about the door. <laughs> and they said, come up here. <laughs> John the Beloved, he said, I saw a door, and I saw a sound. Anyone else catch that? We all think he heard a sound. He saw a sound. I may be tweaking some people here, but we have a friend, Akiana. She's a famous painter, has painted pictures of heaven. She's been on Oprah. She's, we were her pastors for a season until they moved away. And she says that in heaven, everything has sound. Colors are alive. Everything. There's a sound. There's a frequency for everything. It's amazing. And I experienced that that day. I'm reading. And so, I, yeah, oh, as John was doing the surround, I, I call his message surround sound. Yeah, that's what I call it. I love frequencies. In fact, in my book, I have a whole chapter on the frequencies of heaven. But anyway, all of a sudden, all I did was I put my hands out like this. I just said, come up here. And I'm like, I want to come up. That's what I said. And I was taken to heaven. And I was taken and I got to hear the worship in heaven. And I've been a worship leader for many, many years, and I sing, and so sound, and music, and all that's so important to me, so I, Papa's so good that way, and I got to hear such sounds, first I went through the whole thing with the thunders, and the lightnings, and wow, <laughs> so I love thunderstorms, and lightning th storms, I, I'm not afraid of them, I love them, because it just takes me back, but the sounds I heard in worship, were, I can't even explain. There are hardly words on earth that can tell you what I heard and can describe. But guess what? They'll never leave me. And so there's different times I enter into a worship service and I hear the sound. It's on earth. It's a little bit filtered. It's not quite what I experienced. But I know, I know that a door has been opened in that place. And I know that heaven joins in. And I have heard it in this room. I believe that heaven is joining in this your gatherings. You've caught the attention of heaven. There's an open gate and an open door that your worship has. You've given him a welcome mat. You've opened something. And I encourage you to keep going in that. Keep going, keep going, because you're going to hear more and more of those sounds. And I believe, I, I prophesied this over uh, our body, but I, I believe in, in the believers gathering in the ecclesia, I believe God's going to give witty inventions. I believe God's going to download new musical instruments, sounds that no one's ever heard of before. And we've seen it start happening in our church. And um, so I'm excited about that. Even down to practical inventions, we have a, a guy in our church that's kind of like a son to us, and he heard that uh, prophecy. It was many years ago. And at that time, he's an engineer. He's left brain, you know, develops a lot of stuff and had a full-time job, had a great job and was working. And <laughs> just, what, a couple years ago, God downloaded an invention to him. We use wood pellet stoves. I know you guys don't need to heat your homes. 
<laughs> unless you live in Munar. But, <laughs> but in our area of the, wood, of the world, we get snow and it's very cold there. And we have these stoves called pellet stoves. Some people burn fireplaces with wood and then they have these little pellets that burn, but they cause a lot of smoke. And our Steve, God downloaded an invention of how to make one of those with no smoke. And it's electrical. Yeah. You plug it into the wall. No, it's not plugged in. No, it's gravity fed. I'm sorry. I've watched the video I just did the other day even, and I don't know I'm getting that wrong. But it's amazing. And he just decided to try to pitch it to some company. And they flew to Idaho from Tennessee, which is quite a ways, to come and check this out. And they're like, they kept saying, well, what's it plugged into? Well, how come it doesn't do that? Where's the smoke? And he said, there's no smoke. And because of it, his product is going around the world. And he told me, he goes, Mama, I remember when you prophesied that. That was a lot of years ago. And it's coming to pass. And I, I believe that. I, it's happening here in India, guys. Why not India? Why not? Why not it, let it happen to those that have walked under an open heaven, that carry an open heaven, that walk in revelation, that co-partner with him? And that's what I want to focus on here in the next few minutes. How long do I have for this session? For Okay, anyway. I don't know either. <laughs> I love it. I want to go to 2 Peter. Yeah. 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. This is in the ESV version. It says, his divine power has granted to us all things. Say all things. All things. All things. All things. So his divine power has granted to, you can say to me, to me, us, all things that pertain to life and godliness. I think that kind of covers pretty much all our life, right? It pertains to all, all things that pertain to all things. Every part of your life, God has granted to us. He has given us access to all power that we need. Through the knowledge of him, Christ Jesus, who called us to his, his own glory. He is, have you got that? He called us to his own glory. Does that boggle your mind? Jesus himself has called you to his own glory. And I love in John 17 when he's talking to his father. And he said, Father, the glory you gave me, I'm giving to them. They are my glory now. <laughs> I'm leaving the earth, but Father, we're leaving them on earth to be our glory. They're my glory, he says. By which he granted us granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them his promises yeah. you may become partakers of the divine nature what part of the nature the divine nature the bible tells us that jesus was man and he was god he was all god and he was all man at the same time that's a mystery. That's a mystery. But we can partake. We can be partakers of his divine nature. So what did Jesus perform and what did he do in his, with his divine nature? If you read the stories, when Jesus showed up, what happened? There were healings. People were set free from demons. The blind eyes opened. The lame walked. Prostitutes were set free. They found love, true love, with Jesus in his, with his divine nature. There was so much. So <laughs> what are we supposed to look like walking in this land? When we were walking, if Peter's shadow can heal, what can your shadow do? Jesus says, greater things, 
And I know for like cessationists and all those kind of people, oh, he just meant that the number will be more than what he did. Well, obviously, there's more millions of people on the world on the earth than just Jesus. But no, he said greater. If you look at that word greater, it means greater in quality, not quantity. Right. It's not about a number. Right. I love doing word studies. So anytime I come across a word like that, I look it up. And when it says, by the way, when it says all, <laughs> you don't even have to look that up. <laughs> it means all. It doesn't mean part. And so when he tells us that we're partakers with his divine nature, it's not that we're partakers with some. Let's see. You can partake in healing the blind, but I'm not going to use you to set the captives free. That's for the big guns. That's just, no, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, I'm giving you my name, my glory, so that you, you, say me, me. can cast out demons, cast out demons. Can, heal can heal the sick, and raise the dead. Raise David Hogan, y'all have heard him? Yes. Yeah, what a testimony. He has seen actual dead raised. It's powerful. It's powerful. We've been quite close to, <laughs> to the dead being raised, but we haven't been there. Well, we have been, actually, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. We have seen the dead raised. Wow, how did I forget that? Yeah, but one of the in most interesting times, a little three-year-old boy in our congregation, actually his grandma and auntie came, so he would come with them occasionally, but um, he drowned in his bathtub. And we were having a function at the church, and someone came and got us. So we ran to the hospital, and we got in there, and here's our little sweet Elijah laying there. And it's, that's hard. <laughs> and um, so the Lord provided. You know, when Jesus went to pray for, was it Jairus' daughter, and he, he had to let, have everybody leave the room that were without faith. And there was a lot of people in that room that were without faith. They were crying and screaming, you know, because a baby died, but uh, they didn't have faith. And it, we just prayed, and when we walked in the room, all of a sudden, everybody without faith left the room. Wow. <laughs> we, have to, we didn't have to say, would everyone without faith leave this room? They left. <laughs> so it was kind of a no-brainer that we were probably going to pray for him. <laughs> so we went over there, and we prayed with faith. And you know what we did? We put our ears down. We kept a hand on his chest, and he had already been dead for a couple hours by the time we found out, and his grandma and auntie were with us, and one other really beautiful believer that we know, and we were praying with faith, and all of a sudden, little Elijah's chest breathed. We got so excited. Breath came to his nostrils, and we thought this was an incredible moment. We start shouting, and I know someone came in <laughs> to see what was going on. But you know what? He didn't come back to life. But there was, an, and it was quite a few breaths he took. And we had a pulse in his neck. And we were so excited. And we were crushed because I was like, this is, oh, wow, this is what we prayed for. And all of a sudden, his mommy wasn't even in the room at the time. She was outside, and all of a sudden, someone came to the door, and she, they said, Bethany said, stop praying. Elijah appeared to her and said, Mommy, I'm in heaven. I don't want to come. Wow. She didn't know that we were praying. I mean, she, I'm sure she knew we were praying, but not to the degree. She was outside. So we had to rest in that. That's a hard one for me. It's a three-year-old. And it's been very difficult for that family. They're, you know, it's hard to lose a three-year-old. But she has clung, just clung to that, that Elijah came to her. It's a mommy. <laughs> I'm having fun here with Jesus. I don't want to come back. Wow. But see, I believe that, that could be a daily occurrence for us. 
You, I just love it. There was another time my friend, she was praying for someone that had been given a death sentence. She went day after day, and it seemed like the blood work got worse. And she called me from the hospital one day, and she goes, Ruth, what happens if this lady dies? And I said, well, what happens if God heals her? <laughs> See, I flipped that. The enemy wants us to look at what happens if they die. Obviously, the Bible says if they die, they go to heaven, and we still rejoice. But what happens if they live and they're healed? And she got a hold of that. And she started praying differently. And all of a sudden, every day, the numbers got better and better. And she was healed. She was a young mom. She was like 30, 32 years old, had a nine-month-old baby. And she was healed. They said she was cancer-free. She went home for five years. Five years later, she did die of cancer. But she said, when my friend was praying for her again, she goes, Suzanne, I just know that this is my time. I can't tell you, but she said, I had five years with my baby. So I'm now okay. You know? And so it, we've got to start looking at things the way he does. We are, we are partakers with him. He is the one that we listen to. He is the one that gives us wisdom. He is the one that gives us discernment to know when and where and why. Yeah. Well, not always why. <laughs> There's still some things I don't know why. But where and when and what, what to say. Just like Jesus, where you go, I'll go. What you say, I'll say. What you pray, I'll pray. The Bible says that Jesus only did what he saw the Father do. We were talking about that in the car recently, and it, that it's just a comforting model. It's what a pattern to follow. But it tells us that we can't do what we think we should do. We have to do what Jesus wants us to do. And he knows at any given circumstance what that person needs, what they need, not what we think they need, but what they need, what he wants them to have. He knows them. You must trust him when you're uh, co-creating and partnering with him. Yes, in the secret place. I'm looking for, I love looking at definitions. And I looked up the word for divine is of, from, or like God. Devoted to God, sacred, providence of God. Providence of God, excellent, delightful, partnership, an association of two or more people as partners, us and him, where two or more are gathered, <laughs> there's so much about him, we are partners with him in this divine uh, activity, this divine life that we're living in him, and I put in here that there's similar words also, collaboration, coalition, I love coalitions, alliances, association, and one of my favorite words is union and unity. It's a key element to partaking in his divine nature. We're first and foremost in union with him, in unity with him. We become one. And if you read the story in the Song of Solomon where the, the two, the beloved and her groom, have gone to the wilderness, and here they come, and the question says... Who is this coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? You can't tell them apart. <laughs> you can't tell where she ends and he begins, and he ends and she begins. Union, unity. And I believe that in this day, we're in union with him and unity, but with each other. We cannot go out there and accomplish anything unless we have unity in the brethren. Psalm 133 how truly wonderful and delightful to see brothers and sisters living together in sweet unity. It's as precious as the sacred scented oil flowing from the beard of the high priest Aaron, dripping down upon his beard and running all the way down to the hem of his priestly robes from his tallit. This heavenly harmony can be compared to the dew dripping down from the skies upon Mount Hermon, 
refreshing the mountain slopes of Israel. For from this sweet realm of harmony, a realm of sweet harmony, God will release his eternal blessing, the promise of life forevermore. So when unity happens, when we're in union with him, then we come together. And by the way, I don't believe we have to agree on every line item to have unity. I believe you can have unity. You lay aside what you don't agree on. It's not worth it. Who cares? As long as you believe and you can come into unity because we all believe in Jesus. We believe in, his, in what he is doing and healing and all of that. Lay the rest aside. Come into unity. This is the day. This is the finest hour for his church. Let's lay aside all pettiness. Let's come into unity. Let's come into union. One. Union means oneness. It is there that God will release his eternal blessing. It is there then as we move out, as we co-work with him, as we partake in his divine nature, it's then as we've come into unity, then he will work. Then you will see signs, wonders, and miracles. By the way, church, you are not to follow signs, wonders, and miracles. They are not for you. Oh, they're wonderful. We've had some incredible signs, wonders, and miracles. We've had gold dust. We've had manna. We've had feathers. And we've had the most beautiful gemstones. 40 carat, 50 carats. We have 40 of them that fell. 40 of them. Gemstones. All of that. But you know what? They mean nothing unless you're in unity. They mean nothing they're not just for display. It came out of union. It literally it came out of union. We were not sitting around asking for any of that. Because with it comes a lot of persecution. So I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I'd heard about people getting gold dust, but I heard about all the criticism that they were getting. So I was like, uh, I don't really want to say God never give us gold dust. <laughs> I kind of learned that. It's kind of like praying, God, don't send me to Africa because I went to Africa. But <laughs> you don't tell God, don't do that. But I was saying, God, unless it's really you, because I'm don't, i not sure I want to pay that price because there is a price. It's fun. It's beautiful. Those gemstones are beautiful to look at. They never get old. It's like you can't even believe it. You can't believe it. But it's not about the gemstones, church. It's not about signs, wonders, and miracles. Because the Bible says they're to follow us. They're to follow us. And I remember we did a conference, and John has, we have at, at times have had have carried some, we've had some gold dust, and we had some leftover ones. <laughs> and John took it, and you know what he did? He anointed the people on the back of their neck with gold dust. Because they're people are supposed to, it's to follow us. Instead, we have the church of today. They're all sitting waiting for a sign. Well, God, if you show me this, I'll do that. <laughs> you find that in the Bible for me. <laughs> you tell me chapter and verse where we tell God that. No, we step out with him. He's our elder brother, and he carries the bigger yoke. Take my yoke upon me, learn of me, for my burden is light. Yeah, his, your burden that you carry. He gets the big yoke. Don't forget that. I don't, like the, I don't like people saying, God will never give you more than you can handle. Sometimes he give us, gives us more than we think we can handle. There have been days like, I don't know if I can take anymore. I've lost six babies. I've lost a home to fire. But you know what? <laughs> God is still good all the time. Yes. But even though it was something I never thought I could bear, guess what? He comes and carries. He's with me. Because I don't have to bear it, by the way. He does. He bears that. He carries me. 
He'll carry you when you don't think you can take another step. <laughs> Whoa. So as we move out, we move out with him. We are co-creating with him. We are co-partnering. His divine power has granted us all things. He's given us all strength. He tells us that. He says, in my name, whatever you do in my name, I will come with you. And when he went away to heaven, he told the disciples, he said, I'm going to heaven, but I'm sending you what? A helper, a comforter, a paraclete. He will come alongside you. The Holy Spirit is here to help us. The Holy Spirit is there to help us. But Jesus also gave us a promise. He said, I will be helping and working on your behalf. It's another mystery. Check it out. He is seated. But we're seated with him. That's another mystery. We are seated with him. We're living on earth. Sometimes when we quote that to other people, they're like, you have two heads. <laughs> How can this be? I don't know how it can be, but it is, because he said it is. And by faith, I have accessed it. By faith, I know I've seen what it does, and you can never persuade me that it doesn't work. It's my experience. I've experienced it over and over and over again. I am 63 years old. I have seen it every day of my life, literally. I was in church when I was three days old. I was laying on the floor under the piano bench when my mother was playing the piano. When I was in her womb, she was leading worship. <laughs> I've known it. And before time began, he knew I would be here now. He already had this all planned. He knew I, we'd be here in India. He already knew it. I didn't know it, but he knew it. He knows all things, and so he is ordained. He is orchestrated, and what we need to do, we need to come alongside him. We need to just hook up with him. Say, okay, Jesus, here we go. Let's go. And you know what I found? Maybe this will surprise some of you. Some days I do that, and Jesus said, so where are we going today, Ruth? I remember the first time he said that to me. I was like, is that the devil talking to me? <laughs> what? Jesus was asking me where we were going. I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. I looked at him. I was like, well, you're supposed to know what we're doing. <laughs> you're God. <laughs> you tell me. He said, no, today, you tell me. You know me, Ruth. You know my voice. You know me, Ruth. Where are we going to go today? What do you want to see today, Ruth? Because that's what I want to see. Yeah. Whoa, come on. Did that? Did, maybe all of you all walking that way, but that was a shock to me. Then I had to apologize to him because I was like, okay, you told me I know my voice, but for a minute I thought you were the devil. <laughs> I didn't, but you know, I, you question, did I eat too much pizza last night? Or, Wow. Did I not get enough sleep? Where did that come from? But we have found it so true that we are so intertwined with him that some days he lets us choose. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because we're choosing his ways. Right. We're intertwined with him. Right. We're stepping out with him. Right. We're moving with the lamb. That's right. Moving with the lamb. Moving with the lamb, I'm surrounded. Moving with the lamb. Moving with the lamb, I'm surrounded. Moving with the lamb. Stepping with the king of kings. Yeah. And you know, one of the verses that says, Moving with the lamb and stepping over my sin. And I was singing, stepping over my fear, fill in the blank, 
stepping over my pain if you need healing, stepping over my bad relationships, fill in the blank. When we're moving with the Lamb, moving with the Lamb, we can trust Him. And He trusts us. Is that exciting? I was so excited. I don't always share that publicly because not every group can handle that. And I kind of, it kind of came to my heart and my spirit. And I was, uh, I was like, okay, is this the crowd I can say that in? And I said it. And if you can't handle it, blame him. But no. <laughs> wow. Ah, so we can partake of his divine nature every day, every way. Isn't this, I put here, isn't this an exciting promise? Oh, I, it just excites me. Just ponder this powerful truth with me. He, the perfect sinless one who conquered death, hell, and the grave, was resurrected on the third day. He's now seated at his father's right hand, has made me and deemed me in all my flaws. I always say all my freckles, all my warts, all my, all my frailties. He has deemed me worthy to partake, to share in and live in his divine nature. Can you stand? <laughs> can, you, can you even comprehend this? He... He has made me worthy. He's made you. He has deemed you worthy. He right. comes and he says, worthy, worthy. Yeah. You, are, you have become worthy. And when the devil says, yeah, but you're not worthy, I say, yeah, you're right. I'm not, but he is. I'm worthy because he's worthy. So don't let the enemy trip you up. He's lying to you. Well, he's kind of telling you a little white lie. Because in your own, you are not worthy. But he is. And he has said you are. And he has said you are worth dying for. He said you are worth being redeemed. And he said you are worth carrying my name. And carrying my glory. Whoa! You can tell I get excited. <laughs> can I get a witness? That's what they say in black churches. Are there any witnesses in here? Can I get a witness to this incredible revelation, to this incredible truth, to this incredible glory? Are you vibrating with heaven's frequencies yet? I'm up here. I'm vibrating right now. Come on. <laughs> Whoa, I want to scream it out from every rooftop. Shout it. Yes, yes. Woo. I sing, I shout, I, I do anything because he is good. His mercy endures forever. He's a good God and he's called me by name. <laughs> wow. <laughs> if we are raised to life in Christ, why do we still live like dead people? We call them zombies. I don't know if that's translatable here. <laughs> we got a whole church of walk, walking zombies. Okay, now we take this step. Isn't God good? Oh, he's so good. We walk like that, and we wonder why no one wants to serve the Lord. What kind of believers are we showing the world? We've not done a good job of portraying who he is of portraying what it looks like to serve him. It is not dull. It is not boring. It's not always easy, except in the glory there is an ease. But it is always, always, always rewarding. It is wonderful. He is good all the time. No matter what I feel like, no matter what happened to me, it's a life beyond explanation. It's a life beyond anything, beyond, beyond, beyond that you could ever imagine. And he says that we can ask and he will do whatever. And it's beyond anything 
eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It hasn't even entered into the mind or the heart of man what God has in store for who? The pastor? The bishop? <laughs> the apostles? Oh, it must be just for them. The fivefold ministry, it's for that. No, for those who love him. Are there lovers in the house? Yes. Are there lovers? Let's love on him tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We honor you, Jesus. Jesus. We love you. There's nowhere else we want to be. There's no one else we want to serve. Oh. We love doing life with you, Jesus. We are not hirelings. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Kings and priests unto our God. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, just love on him. Just love on him. I love you. How I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King. In what you hear, let me be a sweet, sweet sound. Let me be a sweet, sweet sound. Let me be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wow. Wow. It just felt like a holy hush. Holy hush came. I believe, yeah. I believe there's some representatives of heaven in this room, angelic activity. I was sensing it in worship. I've been sensing it. When I was up here and I went to move to the right, I, I bumped into something. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cloud of representatives of the cloud of witnesses. Not every time I minister, but tonight, the Lord sometimes lets me know that my dad's watching in. I saw my dad. I didn't see my, sometimes my mom and dad, I, I don't go looking for that, but just, it's not every time, but certain times. I think tonight what I was sharing, it's, was a passion of my dad's heart and so it was an extension of uh, something that he preached mm. but I also had, earlier I really felt like uh, there was that Elijah Elijah was in the room and every time I sense that Elijah's here I always go to Malachi 3 and the spirit of Elijah will come and cause the hearts of the fathers to return to the sons and daughters. And the hearts of the children, the sons and daughters, to return to their fathers. And I know that in this room, and even last night, the people in the streets, when we asked what we can pray with, it was for personal family relationships. So I don't want to ignore that right now if Elijah's in the room. I just think we need to pray for families that can be reconciled. 
you have unrest in your family, and maybe you can relate to what Melissa Joy shared and you've lost some hope tonight, be, may we be infusing you with hope. We had a son that was away from God for 10 years, tried to be an atheist. <laughs> Took 10 years. We didn't think it'd take that long. <laughs> he was raised in our ministry. He was our drummer. We were shocked when he walked away. And <laughs> then he started to raise our children, our grandchildren, in a home of an atheist. <laughs> but 10 years, and I just... God did such an incredible thing. How he, It was a long story. I'm not going to go there except how God, who God used to bring him back. Our son has many tattoos. And as a mom, I was like, I don't like those tattoos. And occasionally I expressed it to him. But the Lord, you know what? Ten years, the Lord told us to not say a word. I don't know if there's any other moms in this room. <laughs> But you try not saying a word if you see your child walking in a way that is very difficult. God kept our mouths most of the time. There was a few days I thought I needed to help God. <laughs> but kept my mouth shut. It was hard. <laughs> but guess who brought our son back to God? A tattoo artist sitting next to him in a gun safety class in our land we can own guns and our son had met him had been in his tattoo shop before but our son he's the best tattoo artist in our city but our son wouldn't go to him because he preaches at everybody <laughs> well guess what it was a setup deal and this guy he's got dreads he does not look like your sunday morning preacher but see, our son wouldn't have listened to a Sunday morning preacher. And he, they spent two hours going back and forth. And finally, the guy says, oh, Andrew, I think we're just leave, losing sleep. Your parents did a great job because our son knew the scriptures. But he said, would you just give God one more chance? And they didn't pray right then, but our son went home and said he got in the shower and prayed to a God he didn't believe in. Nothing happened, Mom, nothing. But God, the next day, <laughs> he got in his work truck and he started driving and he decided that he was just going to swear at God. Call him this like tweaked my theology, guys. So if it tweaks yours, it's okay. <laughs> and he, just, he said with one breath, he was saying anything he could. And he said the next breath, he was weeping and had to pull over beside the road and had a God encounter in that car. It's a unique thing. God will use a dreaded, tattoo artist if that's what it takes if he knows your son or daughter needs it he will use he used a donkey <laughs> he used a blinding light that apprehended Paul threw him to the ground God is hello God's Elohim he is the creator he is the one that made us. He made your families. He made your son and daughter, your mother, your father. He knows what will turn their hearts. Please trust him. I encourage you tonight. So let's just if you, raise your hand if you need this in your family. And I'm going to have everyone that has hand raised, someone around them, reach out and touch them. We're going to believe for household salvation. It's in the Bible. That night in prison, <laughs> what happened? The jailer and his entire household. The jailer, he was a Roman jailer. He was not a Christian. He was not. He was against. But guess what? <laughs> they had an encounter, an angelic encounter happened. 
And he and his entire household, the Bible says. So why can't, if he do it for the jailer, why can't he do it for you? So tonight, Jesus, in this room, with faith and believing in our hearts, you, 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 Lord, are able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. We lift up every family unit in this room, and especially the ones with their hands raised, and we are believing for divine encounters of the best kind, close encounters. We believe, Jesus, we've heard that you're sending, uh, we've heard so many stories that you're sending you, Jesus, you're appearing to people in the night, to people of all faiths, to people that hate you. But Jesus, you show up right at the right moment and they're turning to you. So Jesus, I'm asking, would you show up or send an angel or send a person right at the right moment that can show up on time, <laughs> in time, on time, at the right moment that will cause hearts to turn. Wow, wow, whoa, 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 whoa. Some of you will get phone calls some of you might get emails. Some of you, it, I don't know how many days. I don't know. I'm not, but some of you, I'm having a sense that it will be very soon. The night it happened with our son, we were at a camp in Montana. We were four hours away from our son, and a pastor happened to stop me and tell me, Ruth, I've been praying for your son, and I feel like he's about to change at any minute. Exactly at that very moment, back four hours away, was when that man was telling our son, would you give God another chance? He did not know. So I'm sensing tonight. See, I believe if it can happen to our son, it can happen to you. It'll happen to you. So tonight, Lord, I just stir up faith in this room with belief, expectation, that they will see this happen. But we give you permission to do it. We give you permission to orchestrate how it's done. And we will rejoice when we hear of your report, of the reports. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.